you evaluate this mysterious integral? What is integral calculus? At its core, integral calculus is about finding area. Here are a few geometric area you might be familiar with. The area of a square, the area of a rectangle, maybe you know the area of a triangle, one half base times height. A circle, pi r squared, the area of a trapezoid, much like a triangle, is one half base one plus base two times its height. And for a regular polygon, its area is given by one half its perimeter times its apothem. The question arises, how would we find an object's area that is irregular such as this one? Maybe it has a straight length, but what is its height? Along different parts of this curve, we see that it has different heights, so we might think about splitting up this area into separate little pieces with different heights. Now, the areas underneath the curve here, if we think about the top of this object as being given by the function f of x, a polynomial, let's say, then each of these heights would be the value of that function at different x values along the way. And so they would be the height of these, let's say we approximate these areas with rectangles. The width of these rectangles, delta x, which will be used changed over to dx in the continuous case, this is going to be length times width. Delta x times f of x is base times height or length times width, the area of a rectangle. And there are several rectangles in this picture now. So we could use those rectangles areas to approximate the area underneath the curve. So the definite integral works in the following way. If we think about taking those rectangles and increasing the number of them underneath the curve so that we make the widths of each of them smaller and smaller and smaller, then we will approach what is known as a continuous case given by a limit. And it is the limit, which is the sum of these rectangles areas, as we make them smaller and smaller and smaller. In other words, jam pack enough little rectangles in there so we almost don't even notice that they're rectangles. So the limit, as we do this, will continuously give us the area. And we're going to look at this a little bit more closely. So. You can imagine starting off with a certain finite number of rectangles to approximate the area, but you see that those rectangles have little areas that are peeking over the curve. Those would be errors in our estimate. So let's take a look at this in a more dynamic way. We have a function here, x squared minus 2x plus 1, and we want to find the area under the curve between 0 to 5. Right now we have five rectangles, five subintervals, estimating the area under the curve. And when we increase that to 10, we see that the little pieces peeking over the top of the curve, they're still there, but they get smaller and smaller and smaller as we increase the number of rectangles. So here now I'm at 100, and I can barely notice that any little piece is peeking over the top of the curve. It almost looks really smooth. Now, of course, we could zoom in and see that there are tiny, tiny little rectangles still approximating the areas and little bumps going right over the curve. So there's tiny little bits of error. But as we increase the number of rectangles again here to a thousand, we've got now what looks completely smooth. It's almost impossible to see the little bumps. At our scale, this is a continuous case. And if we think about putting the number of subintervals, number of rectangles, and let it go to infinity, or we let the width of these rectangles go to zero, we get what's called the limit or the continuous case. And we call that the area under the curve. That is the definite integral. Integrals come in actually two varieties here. 
we have the definite integral, which is the area underneath the curve on a certain interval from A to B, and we call those the limits or boundaries of integration. We see them on the top and the bottom of that S-type symbol for integral. And then there's the indefinite integral, which we'll talk about a little bit, called the antiderivative. So the integral symbol, with f of x being the curve, dx is the representation of the area under the curve from a to b, and Riemann sums, or those little rectangles, are used to estimate them. Now when you start working with integrals, there's a bunch of different algebra that you can find there, adding functions, reversing the interval, interval of zero length, and adding intervals together, all work within the realm of integral calculus and so there's a real science behind how all of these things work together. The antiderivative. So when we take the derivative of a function it's called differentiating and the result we write it as f prime of x or df dx. Now if we had a derivative and we just consider it as its own function g of x we ask ourselves, what function did I take the derivative of to get this function, g of x? So what would we get by going backwards? This is called integrating. And the backwards result is called the antiderivative, or the indefinite integral. So this would be an integral with no limits of integration, therefore leaving us with just a function in terms of x. So here's an example of a very classic formula for an antiderivative. The antiderivative of x to the nth power, where n is some integer, let's say. You get as a formula x to the n plus 1 power divided by n plus 1 plus some constant of integration c. So for example, let's take something like x to the 99th power. We're going to integrate that with no limits of integration, so this is an indefinite integral. So we want to find its antiderivative, which we represent as capital F of x. Using this power rule, x to the 100 over 100 plus c is the antiderivative we're looking for. This works just as well for polynomials, and because of the linearity of integrals, meaning because an integral is really representing a sum of things, you can break sums up into smaller chunks using the associative property. So the linearity of integrals allows us to separate a polynomial into smaller separate pieces that we can evaluate their antiderivatives using the power rule above, and then recombine their results. Here we get a new polynomial plus an arbitrary constant c as our antiderivative. Now what about the antiderivative of something like sine of x that doesn't have a power on it? That requires more rules. This is the art of integral calculus. The definite integral is the area underneath the curve between the points A and B on the x-axis. If that area is above the x-axis, it's positive. If it's below the x-axis, it's negative. Therefore, we call it the signed area. Now, if capital F of x is the antiderivative of our function, we can use that with the first fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate the integral. In practice, integrals are evaluated by their antiderivatives at their endpoints, at A and B, the limits of integration. And so we'll see a few examples of how this will work in just a few moments. The first fundamental theorem of calculus can be stated in a number of ways. Take, for example, the integral from 0 to 2 of the function 2x minus x squared. Our function 2x minus x squared is a parabola. Here I have graphed on the right. We're interested in finding the area under the curve from 0 to 2. The antiderivative of 2x minus x squared is going to be 2 times x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 plus c. The 2s in the beginning there will cancel each other out, and so we can write the antiderivative of this function as x squared minus one-third x cubed plus c. We will now use this 
antiderivative to evaluate it at the limits of integration to find the value of this definite integral, to find the area underneath the curve. So first, the antiderivative evaluated at the limit point two will give us two squared minus one third two cubed plus some constant. That'll be four minus eight thirds plus our constant. And then if we put this together, 12 minus eight thirds plus our constant, we get four thirds plus our constant. So that's our antiderivative evaluated at x equals two. Now we're going to evaluate the antiderivative at x equals zero. Zero squared minus one third zero cubed plus a constant leaves us with just the constant. So f of zero, capital F of zero, is just the constant. And now by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we're going to subtract the two values, f of two minus f of zero. That's going to give us four thirds plus the constant minus the same constant. The constants will cancel each other out and we just get four thirds or one and one third or for you decimal enthusiasts, 1.3 repeating. And a quick check in Desmos confirms that the area under the curve of our function is 1.3 repeating. And now on to our integral from zero to one of the function x raised to the x power dx, which Desmos tells us has a value of 0.7834 approximately. And on the right hand side, I've graphed that to show you the area we're interested in. Now using a little trick that Joseph Bernoulli used in 1697 to find the value of this integral, e raised to the power of y can be given by a power series. We can express x to the x power in terms of e and natural log. So e raised to the natural log of x to the x power is the same as x to the x power. This allows us to write x as the x power as something called an infinite power series, one that is convergent. Now, putting this infinite series into the integral as a function, we can do some kind of fancy little tricks here since integrals are sums and the sigma symbol also represents a summation. We can pull that sigma symbol outside of the integral and leave ourselves with just the important parts of the integrand, the thing inside the integral. We're gonna need integration by parts. That's right, integration by parts is a method that is necessary to evaluate something this complicated. Let me take you through integration by parts. We imagine that a function that we have inside an event integral is of the form u times dv. And by a little work, you can get this formula uv minus the integral of v du. This is the integration by parts formula. So here, what I'm doing is I'm looking at our integrand as a product of two functions. And I'm choosing carefully what I want u to be and what I want dv to be. And then I'm differentiating and integrating those things in the process of integration by parts. Now, out of this, we get two pieces, the uv part of the formula and the minus the integral of v du part of the formula. Here I've highlighted in yellow and blue. And what we're going to do is evaluate these things one by one. At x equals one, we can evaluate the limit of this first term and it'll cancel to zero. It's a little more tricky when we try to evaluate it at zero because the natural log of zero is undefined. So rather we have to use a limit definition to evaluate that part of the expression. So a limit approaching zero from the right hand side of this little expression we have here can be rearranged in a way. And what we're gonna do is try to piece out a very specific limit that's involved in this expression. And that is the limit of x times the natural log of x. That limit goes to zero, and that's what I'm going to show you, which will take the rest of that part to zero. So the limit as x goes to zero of x natural log of x by direct substitution is undefined. 
So we have to use something called L'Hopital's rule. And I'm going to rewrite x times natural log of x a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as natural log of x divided by 1 over x. This is a little algebra trick. And then we can employ L'Hopital's rule by differentiating the top and the bottom of this rational function and then take the limit as x goes to 0. And with a little bit of algebra magic, we can find that the limit goes to 0. So with that, the entire limit that we were looking for in that first term of our expression in our integration by parts goes to 0. Now, we are on to the task of taking on this integral, again, by parts. And we're going to have to iterate it a number of times, n number of times. Multiple integration by parts will show a cyclic pattern that reoccurs in each of these iterations. And that is that every time we do an iteration, we wind up with x to the nth power, and then ln of x raised to one lower power. So we still retain an x to the nth power in the integrand, and an x to the, or natural log of x to the n minus one power. And as we continue to iterate, which means as we continue to do the integration by parts here, you will see a specific pattern of the coefficients that are coming out of this start to happen in front of the integral. <clears throat> so n iterations would reduce the natural log of n down to zero, the zeroth power. And natural log of zero, natural log to the zero power is equal to one. So here we just have the integral of the x to the nth power from zero to one after those n iterations are done. And that evaluates very easily to one over n plus one. So putting this all together, we have negative one to the nth power, n factorial, all divided by n plus one raised to the n plus one power. Now substituting the value we got in for our integral, negative one to the nth power, n factorial, all divided by n plus one to the n plus one power, we see that our n factorials cancel out. And so our integral from zero to one of x to the x power dx is given by the infinite power series, which is negative one to the nth power over n plus one to the n plus one power. And if we expand that out, it's one minus one over two squared plus one over three cubed minus one over four to the fourth, etc. If we do a partial sum series, we can get a, a close approximation to the area. And we, if we compare our partial sum to the actual value that Desmos gave us above, we see that we're on our way to calculating the correct value. There you have it, integral calculus. It's about finding area, but it's about so much more. It's about solving differential equations and exploring the world and how it changes around us. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more videos. Hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more.